Um, there is a CPE evaluation form. Um, if you'll fill that out, if you're interested in having that, uh, we'll help you get that, especially if you're a CPA. Um, there's also an Aspire speaker evaluation form. You'll fill that out, give us some feedback. We're looking for speakers for different events. We have uh, a, a estate planning attorney coming in November to talk some about what all is going to happen in the estate planning world um, with different rules in the tax area and stuff like that in the future horizon. Um, in Washington, we keep using our credit card up there pretty regularly. Somebody's going to have to pay that bill. And one of the easiest things is the theft tax. You know, that it's not fair that you've already paid in after tax dollars, so they got to get another grab at it. So, you know, and we think that exclusion number is going to come down. He's going to talk about that some and the exposure that most of us will have to some form of state tax. Um, we also are interested, if you know of other speakers, other topics, we know that like for instance in March, um, on March 8th, which would be the Wednesday we typically do this, um, is National Women's Day. We may have a group of women that are CEOs come in and talk about how the world has changed, what's happened in their lifetime, and some general you know, updates and ideas and thoughts that they have with women in the workforce and what's going on. So we're trying to be out there looking for new and different topics, so please, covet your input and feedback and stuff. It's about finding something that was the whole idea of Aspire, was that people aspire to hear topics that they probably hadn't heard, heard about before, and then we could go find and marshal those people together and bring the speakers. Um, introduction to the speaker today. It's my pleasure to bring Harold back. Harold Montgomery was with us back a few months ago and did Crypto 101. Um, he has an impeccable record of building a number of different companies across the U.S., India, other places. Um, he's got a lot of experience in crypto, blockchain, NFT, and then also raising funds in the U.K., Europe, India, and then working with banking relationships and all kinds of different things that go on with some of the different territories we're going to talk about this morning. But we thought it would be interesting to bring him back with the volatility in crypto has kind of followed all the volatility in every other financial market that's out there, so we thought it was a chance to come back and revisit that and talk about how that kind of follows what's going on. So we're going to turn the floor over to Harold and let him educate us a little about where he thinks things are going. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, thanks for having me, everybody. He didn't tell me my homework was going to be graded here with this <laughs> speaker evaluation form. But uh, I was here last, uh, I think it was February or March, and talking about Crypto 101. And I guess it couldn't have been too bad then because I'm back here again. Uh, but uh, so anyway, I appreciate you guys turning out for a free breakfast and you have to put up with me for about 20 minutes as well. Um, let, today I want to take what we did in the spring of Crypto 101 and take it one step further and talk about what it means for the development of the web and user participation of the web and where we're going. And I'm calling this NFTs, the metaverse and Web3, but it should really be called, wait, what? It, it, because it's all moving so fast that the, the common response I hear every time I talk about these things is, wait, what? And, and so the what part is, okay, what is it? What are we talking about when we talk about NFTs? What are we talking about when we talk about the metaverse? And what are we talking about when we talk about Web3? But more importantly, what does it mean? What does it mean for businesses? What does it mean for consumer behavior? What does it mean for user engagement in the web? And we're going to talk about that. That is a big iceberg, and I don't have all the answers by far. All I can do this morning is point you in certain directions and show you the trend lines and then ask you to watch them over time because they're real and they're really big and they're probably happening right under your feet and you haven't seen it. If, if, most, if you're like most people. But quickly, why am I here? I've been 30 years in the payment industry. I've been CEO of seven different payment companies, identifying opportunities and scaling them up. I've been three years now working in the crypto space as managing director of Wirex USA, which is a London-based crypto management app. And my job was to get them into the US market, which we did. We launched in February of this year. But let's say, I want to take a quick detour and update you on events in the crypto market because when I spoke here in February or March was sort of the, the uh, tip of Niagara Falls and everything sort of went to hell since then. So it's sort of interesting to take a, a detour down one rabbit hole in particular. Basically, the headlines are, as you probably know, prices crashed. Bitcoin peaked out at $60,000 at Bitcoin last year. It's now right around 20000 interestingly. It's been more stable than the stock market by far for the last three or four months. Bitcoin's been hovering right around 19, 20, 21,000, somewhere in that range. And if you look at the volatility in it, it's been a lot safer than stocks in the last three or four months. 
I don't know what that means, by the way. I'm just saying it seems to be a fact. Uh, there have been a couple of big financial blow-ups, uh, one of which I'll sort of dive into here in a second, specifically Terra, a company in South Korea that got pretty big pretty fast and then pretty small pretty fast. Uh, another one in Israel called Celsius that imploded, and it's related to Terra, and another investment firm called Three Arrows that was also related to Terra that also imploded. So this is like a three dominoes stuck together that all fell at the same time for the same reasons. There have been a host of resignations, among them all these guys who were leading lights in the crypto space, including Jesse Powell from Kraken. I'm sorry, you probably can't read that. It doesn't really matter. The point is you have a changing of the guard. The, the point of that bullet is not to read it literally, but just to recognize that you have a changing of the guard going on in crypto. You have a, an internet-style 2020 meltdown going on here, and the early banshees that came into the crypto market and waved the Bitcoin flag relentlessly uh, are exiting stage left now. Uh, and that's the important uh, message behind that particular bullet. You're now going to get an entry of the adults coming in to supervise the kids who have grown too big for their britches, and you're going to see these companies actually turn into real companies that are properly managed and properly done, regulated, financially correct, and so on and so forth. Um, let's take a dive on Terra Luna, though, because it's a really interesting case. Terra Luna is in South Korea, founded by a Stanford guy named Do Kwon, young guy. I think, I'm sure he's under 30, but I can't remember exactly. It is an algorithmic stablecoin. It is a cryptocurrency designed to hold its value at a dollar. Stablecoin means value at a dollar, right? Consistently, no volatility involved. It uses a computer program, an algorithm, to balance two different cryptocurrencies, long and short positions, to constantly triangulate back to a dollar. Okay? So let's take a look at a, a metaphor for this uh, mechanism of how this currency uh, balances itself. You have two different currencies simultaneously. You have Terra and you have Luna. Okay? And they relate to one another through a kind of a balancing system where they go back and forth. So if you have demand to sell, this is a sell example, you have a sale of uh, Terra hitting the market, you need to balance that with a certain amount of Luna, and then everything will balance out at a dollar. And if, and if all of it gets a little too out of kilter, like somebody puts more Terra on the balance, that's going to push the price of Terra down, right? Supply, demand doesn't meet supply, the price is going to go down. The algorithm will then force the price of Luna up, in which case people will sell it and add more to that side, and it'll all balance out again. And if it gets too out of kilter, we've got a whole ton of Bitcoin behind it that we can add to the market to stabilize either side of the equation. Right? So the ultimate backstop is a whole bunch of Bitcoin. Now, an alarm should have gone off in your head, and I'll show you what it was in a second. If it did, good for you. You're following the example very well. I'll, I'll tell you what the alarm is about in just a second. But let's take a look at this system. This is a supply-demand balance system. The missing piece of this graphic is demand. It always implies that there's sufficient demand for whatever we have an excess supply of, right? And so what happens if we add more Terra? Well, you should add more Luna. But what happens if we add a lot of Terra and we do it in a short period of time. Well, bad news. What happens is bad news. You don't have enough Bitcoin to back that up. And so you wind up losing $60 billion in about four hours. Because everybody loses faith that the balancing system and algorithm is going to work. They panic. They pull their money off the table. You get a flood of, of supply. You have insufficient demand. You, the backstop isn't there. Bad news. This is what happens when programmers do finance. <laughs> right? That's the moral of the story. The, that market sage, Yogi Berra, said that in theory there is no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. Okay? <laughs> so we all know. Anybody who's dealt in the stock market at all, and I suspect many of you, would recognize this as a classic short squeeze. The, the, in, in, here's the alarm that you should have seen earlier. Bitcoin drops 50% in value during this period of time. So the market is shaky to start with. Everybody loses faith that the backstop of Bitcoin is really going to be there and really going to work out. And so this is a classic short attack, right? It's a naked short. 
you dump a whole lot of Terra on the market and it breaks the system and it does it really fast. This is another subcategory called stop, stop loss hunting. Like where is the stop loss? And you knew what it was when, unlike the stock market, you know where the stop losses are here because the whole thing has to balance at a dollar. Pretty easy to game the system and that's exactly what happened. And so it results in a lot of bad news for a lot of people and pulls down Celsius and Three Arrows Capital, which were heavily invested in all this at the same time. And the, and the, the wreckage of this is still getting sorted out even now. Uh, Do Kwon is, is on the run and South Korean authorities are after him and we'll see what happens. Uh, it's like a lot of bad news. Um, okay, so that creates a chill in the market. So you may remember from my last presentation, we talked about decentralized finance. That's where two people own cryptocurrency and want to lend it or borrow it from one another directly. Like I'm borrowing from you, you're borrowing from me, whatever. That's decentralized finance. In December 2021, there was $248 billion worth of cryptocurrency staked in decentralized finance uh, marketplaces, right? By September 2022, that had hit a low of 53 billion. So that's what I call a chill in the market. We named it basically 80% decline in the value of staked assets. However, all is not lost because when you look at a chart of the number of Ethereum, not the value, but the number of Ethereum staked, it's actually pretty steady. So this is the number of coins, not the dollar value of coins. Keep in mind, Ethereum has fluctuated a lot during this period. It's now down around $1,300 this morning, uh, down from a high of about 4,000, I think. So it's declined significantly, but the numbers of Ethereum staked have held steady, which indicates to me that people still believe in the fundamental business model, even if the valuations, the headline valuations aren't there. And that introduces a key concept I'm going to return to over and over, which is I really want you to focus on the technology and the system, not the valuations. Everybody talks about the valuations of various cryptos, and that matters. But what matters a lot more in the longer term is the fundamental technology and the value that that creates, which is not reflected in the prices of the cryptos. Okay, so I'm going to dissociate the investment proposition from the fundamental value creating nature of the technology in this presentation. Life goes on, right? We've got, there we go. Remember the internet meltdown of 2000? This is very similar. This is a purging of the market. You're getting a purging of weak uh, companies. You're getting a purging of underfinanced companies. You're getting a purging of uh, CEOs who are just, you know, blindly moving towards growth at all costs, and you're getting a rationalization of the business plan. You're going to see a big shakeouts happening even as we speak. But blockchain technology is advancing. As I mentioned, I want you to focus on the technology, not the prices. Regulations are tightening. The regulators, you can hear them moving in on their, on their white horses. They're going to come in and straighten all this out and it'll get better. And so all I can say is stay tuned and focus on the technology, not the prices. That's the important message. Okay, shifting back to the main topic of today, what is an NFT? Remember, we're gonna talk about NFTs, the metaverse, and Web3. There's a lot to cover, so I'm gonna go pretty quick. What is an NFT? Well, the literal phrasing is it is a non-fungible token, NFT, non-fungible token. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it's a record on the blockchain which is associated with a particular specific digital or physical asset. So NFTs typically contain a reference to a digital file such as a photo, a video, or an audio. So music can be an NFT, art can be an NFT, a lot of things can be an NFT. The ownership of an NFT is recorded on the blockchain and can be transferred from owner to owner allowing them to be sold or traded, right? So you can think of these as baseball cards. Baseball cards are NFTs in the real world. Baseball cards are becoming NFTs on the web, and other things are becoming NFTs on the web, and they can be traded around like baseball cards. They are collectible items. NFTs can be created by anybody. The threshold, the technological threshold for creating an NFT is actually really low. Even, even I can do it and have done it. Um, and anybody, it requires no particular coding skills. There are websites you can go to, you can upload a photograph, you can make it an NFT, you can publish it, you can put it up for sale on OpenSea, and a lot of people are doing exactly that. NFTs can be, and this is a really important feature, automated smart contracts, and you can share revenue through them. So for example, if I create a work of art in an NFT and I post it on the web, I can 
specify in the NFT that any future sale will accrue to my benefit as well to the order of, let's just say, 10%. So if I sell you my NFT for 100 bucks and then you sell it to somebody else for 200 bucks, I'm going to automatically get 20 bucks of that sale. It's like a residual based on the traffic that goes on from here forward. It's a, it's a call option on any future trade in that NFT. And that's a really interesting feature. It's totally automated. Once you mint it, you can't change it, right? You can't go back and, and modify the terms of the contract. So you put it out there, and it floats in the universe, and you wait and see what happens. Because NFTs are uniquely identified assets, they differ from cryptocurrencies, which are fungible. Right, so let's dig into fungibility. It's basically the concept of single versus multiples, right? So cryptocurrency or token is fungible, right? You have 21 million Bitcoins, but a non-fungible token is one of a kind. So an NFT is a single issue crypto. The technology is basically the same. You're just making one of them, and so that gives you different outcomes and different use cases as a result. So again, just to drill down on the fungibility issue, a dollar bill is pretty much the ultimate fungible item, right? They're all pretty much the same. They do the same thing. They have the same value. The only difference is a serial number. Sometimes people collect serial numbers like, you know, 0001 or whatever, but basically dollars are fungible, right? Bitcoin is fungible. There's 21 million of them. They all do the same thing. It doesn't really matter. My Bitcoin's the same as your Bitcoin, effectively. Ethereum, likewise, highly fungible. That's the whole point. You want them to be fungible, otherwise they don't create a an ecosystem of economic value if they're not fungible. But let's talk about what's non-fungible. Well, the, the sort of ultimate non-fungible item is the Mona Lisa, right? There's one, that's it. Uh, there's only ever one, there's only ever been one, there's only ever gonna be one Mona Lisa. So these are commodities and this is unique. But what makes something unique? Well, let's talk about that for a second. So certainly, in the case of the Mona Lisa, it's physically unique, right? It, it, it literally cannot be duplicated. It can be imitated, but it can't be duplicated, right? But these are, if I show you these two things, you're gonna look at those and say, well, these are the ultimate commodity, right? How many, how many billion plastic disposable razors have been made in history, right? I don't even know, I don't think anybody knows, but lots, right? And they're not, they're not different. They're all pretty much the same. But are they really? If I told you that I was on my honeymoon in Paris and I lost my luggage on the way over there and so we had to go to the pharmacy and I needed to buy a replacement razor, so I pick up this, this particular one, this blue razor, and then it started to pour rain. And so my wife and I duck into a, a funky little cafe on the left bank and we spend all afternoon drinking coffee and talking and laughing and watching Paris go by, and it was the most romantic afternoon of my entire life. If I told you all that, and then I told you that I kept that razor because it reminds me of that day. Okay, that's not just another razor anymore. That's a <coughs> souvenir and a memento that is unique to that moment in time. Okay, that's not a true story, by the way, but I really like it. <laughs> but I really like it a lot, and it gets the point across. Whereas, okay, these are just a bunch of blades, right? I don't even think about these. I don't even remember when I changed my razor last. Just every time I think about it, I go again okay, for a new new blade. Okay, but that one on the left, that's not a razor. That's a part of my life. Okay, so. The point is the meta information, the information surrounding the item or the context of it, that's everything, right? That's, that's what makes that what it is. Is it, can I put a price on it? No, if I lose it, I'm gonna be heartbroken, right? But that's what it is. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about use cases for NFTs and I sort of break them into two categories, silly and real. And so the silly category starts with the original NFT artwork called CryptoPunks. CryptoPunks are really simple digital images that were minted a couple of years ago and people bought them just for kicks and then they turned into a thing. They turned into a real thing and I'll show you more about it in a second. Here's another one called Chromie Squiggle. Some guy on the West Coast starts making little squiggles. They're all different, everyone is different. He mints thousands of them and people like them and they buy them. 
And here's Damien Hurst making an artwork out of butterfly wings and publishing it as an NFT. I don't know, can we reduce the lights at all? It might be better visual for you guys if we could. Um, and here's a guy who took a picture of a jump shot in the NBA, publishes an NFT and sold it to somebody. Okay, these are kind of silly use cases if you ask me, but they're real and people are doing them. And in fact, go you one better, in line with my example about the, um, the use cases and the meta information, I went to the NFT show in New York a couple of months ago and saw this young lady dressed up as her crypto punk. So this is life imitating art, right? That is what her crypto punk looks like. And she imitated it dressed up and had a speaking slot at the NFT show. Okay, here's the chromy squiggle dude. And you can see here, you, you can't see it in detail very well, but these are all the different series of chromy squiggles that he's done. Right up here, every one is slightly different series and there's 10,000 in each series. And here's, here's the guy dressed up as a chromy squiggle talking to you about chromy squiggles. Okay, you with me on the silly? Everybody vote for silly? I think it's silly, except if I told you that Chromey Squiggles are selling for anywhere from $1,700 to $714,000 right now in OpenSea, I gotta, I gotta pull back the silly label all of a sudden, go wait a second, what's going on here? And so let's talk about this one, right? This is a two-dimensional NFT of a chimpanzee dressed in a leopard skin with a fez looking pretty bored. Right? This is one of a series called Board Ape Yacht Club, number 9357. There are 10,000 of them. And take a look at that. This one is on sale on OpenSea for 78 Ethereum, which is $121,672.20. Okay, this is the going price for a Board Ape Yacht Club NFT on OpenSea as of yesterday. I mean, I took this frame in September, doesn't really matter. It hasn't changed, it's the same. I checked it last night. Okay, $120,000 for an NFT that is pretty dumb? I mean, why, why is somebody doing this? What, what's going on here? How did that happen? Okay, the Board Ape Yacht Club launched in April of 2021. So far, <clears throat> in about, what's that, 18 months, it has sold over a billion dollars worth of NFTs have traded hands multiple times. Remember, I said that you can put a tax on every subsequent sale. Now, that isn't the case with, NF, with Board Ape Yacht Club, but imagine if it were, a little bit of that billion is going back to the original issuer every time, okay? It's a private online club with exclusive events online and in real life that the NFT gets you into. So the NFT becomes now a ticket to things that are happening online and in real life and they do, they have little gatherings of, of Board Ape Yacht Club owners in real life, parties and whatnot. And it, you, the intellectual property rights for the NFT go with the image, which isn't always the case. You can actually separate those two things out. So the point is community and context and meta information matter a lot here, right? So it turns out on the other hand that there was a pretty limited market for this kind of thing and many imitators came about, of course, if you saw those kind of numbers, you'd start minting NFTs. As I mentioned, it's really easy to do. There are tons of imitators and they all pretty much flopped. And so this is a, a graph of the NFT market for the last year and I don't know if you can see it, <clears throat> but the red line is the dollar value and the white line, which is more visible, is the number of traded NFTs. And you can see right here, we had a peak in April of last year. You can't really see the red numbers here, but basically any measurement you wanna take in the NFT market is down somewhere between 80 and 95%. Doesn't really matter what metric you wanna use. They're all, the whole thing just basically collapsed. Right in here, you can see it's just trending down to nothing. So big burst of enthusiasm, a lot of activity. One huge spike right here, April 30th of this year. What in the world is up with that? Well, it's our old friends, the Board Ape Yacht Club. They're onto a good thing, and so they started making three-dimensional NFTs, so they're board apes, and they took it to the metaverse. Okay, this is my way of making sure you pay attention for the rest of the, of the conversation, because I want to show you at the end what that looks like, but we're not there yet. We gotta put the building blocks of the metaverse together. We did it with crypto, now we're doing it with NFTs. Now we're gonna talk about serious use cases for <laughs> NFTs, and then we're gonna talk about the metaverse and Web3, Digital art is a serious use case. People are buying digital art, not a lot, 
they're displaying it on TV screens. Like you guys have a TV screen that when it goes, uh, when it goes dormant, it rotates an image around. You can put your NFT on there. You can put it on a screen and just display it the way you would a, a work of art. Someday, those will be screens rotating NFTs. Ticketing. <laughs> Ticketing is a big use case that a lot of people are talking about. It hasn't shown up in real life. But imagine a Super Bowl ticket in the form of an NFT, electronically delivered, collectible, and the NFL gets a royalty every time you sell it or trade it. Ha, big deal. Imagine car titles done by NFT. Why do you have a paper car title that can be lost, stolen, destroyed, manipulated, changed, whatever? Forget it. They're going to go to NFTs. Home titles. This one's going to take a lot longer, but property titles should be nft I'm not so optimistic about that actually showing up in the real world because there are so many embedded constituencies and regulation around that. I think it's going to take a while, but conceptually it makes all the sense in the world. It's surprisingly easy to perpetrate a, a property title fraud today in Dallas County, like really amazingly easy. And if you Google that, uh, you'll find there's a guy in prison who's perpetrated uh, quite a few property frauds and is still doing it from prison. Um, it's really simple and easy. But there are now two companies, ProP and Vesta at least, uh, who are selling uh, property as an NFT, and I'll show you that in just a second. Art, antiques, authentication of provenance. This is a big one. Here's a great story. Who remembers Thomas Jefferson's bottle of wine from Paris, discovered about 10 or 12 years ago? You can see the date, 1787, Lafitte, very famous vineyard. And here are the initials TH period, J period, Thomas Jefferson dated from the period in which Thomas Jefferson lived in Paris as our ambassador to France before he became president. And this was discovered sort of bricked up behind a wall in Paris. And a famous wine sleuth found it and sold them for several hundred thousand dollars a copy. Really great story, right? Very big at the time. Unfortunately, it wasn't true. They were faked. Now, <clears throat> if that had been nft at the time it was created, so imagine Screaming Eagle, Eagle Cabernet from California that sells for $4,000 a bottle. If you NFT it, it can't be faked after that, right? This one was fake. The guy was sued and went to prison. Um, but let's talk about art. This is uh, Van Gogh's famous portrait of Dr. Gaucher, painted in 1897. Van Gogh sold it to buy food for about 300 francs, which at the time was 57 US dollars, about one month's wages apparently, as far as I can tell. A little hard to track the franc back that far. But in 1990, this painting sold for 75 million, and it obviously traded hands several times in between. So imagine uh, that for the finance nerds in the room, that's 16% a year compound annual growth rate, not too bad for a 100-year investment. Uh, and, but NFTs would have allowed part of the sale proceeds of every transaction to go back to Van Gogh, Gogh or his heirs. So can you imagine that with this picture multiplied by all of Van Gogh's artwork by the prices and the trading volume in Van Gogh's artwork and you begin to get the idea of the magnitude of what an NFT could have done for the artist had he NFT'd that work at the time. Let's talk about Rembrandt, the famous painting, The Night Watch. This is a giant painting. It's in Amsterdam in the Rijks Museum. If you haven't seen it, it's like 15 feet long and 18 feet high or something. Anyway, it's enormous. It's bigger than life size. And so I want to show you a video, and I hope it works, of uh, something that's brand new, literally happening today. Meta Rembrandt welcomes you to The Night Watch NFT, a project centered around the preservation of Rembrandt's legacy. Rembrandt's greatest painting will be carefully crafted into 8,000 NFT pieces. Our project began with Professor Von Vitry, who had a vision to collect and preserve all of Rembrandt's artworks. Remarkably, he was able to digitally remaster over 300 of Rembrandt's paintings before his passing. In honor of the late professor, the Rembrandt Heritage Foundation picked up the torch by memorializing Rembrandt's legacy in the digital world. The Meta Rembrandt Museum. The designated space to become home of all of Rembrandt's finest paintings, accessible for anyone and digitally preserved for the years to come. By owning one piece of the Night Watch NFT, it will open every door of the Meta Rembrandt Museum for you to experience Rembrandt's timeless collection, then experience it even more with the plethora of utilities at your disposal. Join us in the preservation of Rembrandt's legacy. Okay. So that's a little nerdy. You have to be really into Rembrandt to think that's a good idea. 
these are selling, they literally opened the door this morning at 7 a.m. our time from Amsterdam and they sell for 0.15 ETH, which is about $195. So feel free to go to the Meta Rembrandt Museum and pick up your piece of the painting that you can then keep, trade, do whatever, and you'll be listed on their uh, wall of honor as a founder of the Meta Rembrandt Museum. The key to that, though, from my point of view, I'm actually a huge fan of Rembrandt, um, is that it centralizes all of Rembrandt's works in one place. So imagine you're a scholar of Rembrandt. You've got to have a pretty healthy travel budget and some connections to get around and see all of his works. It's no small thing because they're spread out all over the place. And um, some are even in private collections that are very difficult to get to. No longer. You can now go to the Meta Rembrandt Museum and see everything in order. You can sort it different ways. You can do all kinds of stuff with it. It's a very cool project. And you should expect other projects like this to come about for Picasso, Monet, whatever. And you'll see online art museums being a real thing. Um, here's, a, here's another use case. This one is serious. This is uh, a video clip of Steph Curry doing a pretty slick pass in a Warriors game. Uh, and it just repeats itself over and over. Um, this is uh, something called NBA Top Shot. This is a real deal. The NBA jumped on NFTs really quickly and started making these short video clips and selling them. And that particular one sold for $27,000. Not silly anymore, is it? It's real. Here's Propy's website. These are two homes, both in Las Vegas. You can buy, uh, and you will be issued an NFT documenting the ownership in that property. And you can pay, I don't know if you can see it, but right here it says buy with crypto. You can take your internet funny money and turn it into a house and get an NFT and never set foot on the property. So what's next? Well, look for NFTs in property titles, like I said, car titles, artwork, oil royalties. That'd be a big one, very current around here, right? These tiny little fractions of oil royalties that get broken up into generations and generations. That should all be on the blockchain. Uh, you wouldn't have to validate the ownership, the provenance, or the reality of that anymore. And all of the little checks that go out on oil royalties um, that you, know, you got from your grandfather or whatever that are down to like a dollar a month or whatever, that's all going to get done or should get done on the blockchain in a frictionless, low cost way. And there's lots of others. We could go on for the rest of the presentation talking about alternative uses for NFTs, but just suffice to say this is a really useful and interesting technology that you're going to start to see populated in lots of different places. But let's move on. So keep in mind, we've now got two building blocks. We've got cryptocurrency. And we've got NFTs. Now we're going to talk about the metaverse. And then we'll bring it all together in Web3. The simplest definition of the metaverse is it's a network of three-dimensional virtual worlds focused on social connection. A more complicated definition is it's a single universal and immersive, that's an important word here, a virtual world that's accessed by use of virtual reality and augmented reality headsets. And for background reading, if you need it, the Bible here is a book called Snow Crash and another one called Ready Player One, which Steven Spielberg made into a, an OK movie uh, a couple of years ago. And both of them are pretty highly predictive about the metaverse and its evolution of what it's going to become, even if they are 20 or 25 years old. They're worth a read. Uh, and you might not be that interested in, in reading a book like that, a science fiction book, except that what those guys talked about is really unfolding right here in real time. I mean, people refer to Snow Crash all the time and Ready Player One to a slightly lesser extent, but it's really, it's been pretty predictive in my experience. So let's talk about VR and AR for a second. Just to differentiate, augmented reality is reality that's souped up in some way. It's reality that's better than reality or added to in some way, but virtual reality is almost totally new. Everything in virtual reality is completely new, different, and doesn't correspond necessarily to the real world in a serious way. And you access it by these goggles. I'm sure you've seen these before. You strap them on your head. You get the, the handholds. They've got gyros in them. They can tell where you are in space. It's very it, it's disorienting. I'll show you that in a minute. But this would be an example of a kind of a silly uh, augmented reality case. You can see that this is real video in the background with some animated add-ins. Here's another one, though. This is a more serious use case. Imagine you're crate and barrel, and you put out an app that allows people to, to just hold up their phone to the place in their house where they're going to put that chair. And then they can get the chair, which, by the way, is an NFT. And they can move the chair around in space and see what it's going to look like. So no more do you have to grab the chair, take it home, put it in place, take it back, whatever. It's all done virtually. 
That's a real use case for augmented reality. Here's another one. You may remember these goggles that Google put out that can show you your schedule, the time, your flights, other information consolidated, and it shows right in front of you. That's augmented reality. Here's another really serious use case in the medical field. These surgeons are pointing at an image of the brain and pointing at different places where they're seeing an image of the brain live in real time and showing where a stroke has occurred and where they need to operate or what they need to go through, what the, what the uh, pitfalls are going to be in the surgery. And that's not that far off, by the way, because our own Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine is adding virtual reality to its training program for surgeons right now. This article from the Dallas Morning News just about a month ago. Uh, and remote training of any kind, right? Hilton Hotels is using virtual reality as remote training. But let's go further in the metaverse. That was all just sort of augmented reality. Now let's take a step into the metaverse as a whole. Remember the metaverse is a completely new world. And the metaverse I'm about to show you is actually on Mars. So you can join up with Onteco and be a founding member of the new civilization they're creating on Mars in the metaverse. And Onteco is a scientifically accurate uh, Mars metaverse, right? Everything is what it's supposed to be and how it, ideally, I should say, will be on Mars. And it's got people from NASA. It, it's led by an architect. This is one of the apartments that you can buy. You can buy them now. They're NFTs. Uh, and you can decorate it. If you want to put a mirror in it, that's an NFT. You want to put a couch in it, that's an NFT. You want to put flowers on the table, that's an NFT. You want to put your chromy squiggle on the wall, that's an NFT as well. It's all driven by cryptocurrency and it's all completely in the metaverse. It does not exist in reality. But the idea here, again back to meta information and involvement, is that the idea is you are creating the new civilization on Mars, and you're actually road testing, so to speak, what will happen. Right? They show you how you're going to grow food. They show you how you're going to get water. They show you how you're going to generate oxygen. All the stuff you need to do. And there are cities that are being built on Mars in this metaverse, and it's all supervised by scientists from NASA and other places who have input into building this community. Believe it or not, there's 150,000 members of the Mars Society in the United States alone, let alone worldwide. So this is a thing, right? It's a real thing. And you can strap on your goggles when you get home from work, and you can go to Mars for the evening. And it's actually, I got to say, really cool. Um, and perfectly legal, by the way. Um, now, it's also a little disorienting. So when you put the goggles on, you know, it's a little bit confusing, I got to say, and even potentially quite scary uh, for certain people, right? <laughs> This is not, I mean, you know, step into the metaverse uh, at your own risk. In fact, literally at your own risk because people actually lose their balance and some of them actually get injured doing this, crashing into walls and whatnot. So, you know, when you strap on the goggles, just, you know, be aware. It can just be downright annoying, too. Like this dude <laughs> on an airplane, you know, grooving out to his metaverse goggles there. So, you know, it, you are in your own little world when you strap on the goggles. Okay, so that's metaverse. Let's park it there. We'll come back to it in a second, but let's talk about Web3. Web3 is, is huge, ongoing, real, and about to be, I think, a tsunami of change in the way the web is structured and architected. It is a fundamental shift in the emphasis of the internet from centralized to decentralized and, importantly, participatory, right? The big shift here is you are part of the web. What I just showed you in Onteco, when you strap on those goggles, you are in Mars. You're not watching Mars anymore, you're in Mars. So I just blatantly stole this uh, slide from Vox Media. They did it better than I could have done. I didn't see a reason to recreate it. This is the evolution of the web, right? From traditional media where you have books, radio, television, these are frozen. You sit down, it's passive, it's one-way delivery. It's curated and scaled. You go to Web 1.0, which is informational websites and shopping websites, multi-device access at best. You go to Web 2.0, which is sort of where we are right now. You are here. That's where we are today with social media interactivity, digital identity, responsive to content, and creating content. Everybody's a content creator. Everybody's got an opinion now, and they put it on the web. 
right, in Twitter or wherever they want to put it. But the next evolution is not only are you going to touch it, you're going to break through and you're going to be it, right? You are now the web. And this is a big shift. It is immersive. It is first person, responsive to one another, and it alters the digital environment. So this is what is happening live in real time. And to give you a different graphic from the same people, thank you Vox Media for saving me some time, the story is in the center of the traditional media, right? When you pick up a book, you are looking at the story. You are external to the story. That's not going to happen anymore. You are the story, and the web interacts with you, and it's driven by whatever your passion is in the pink circles here, and the narrative you want to drive and the talent that you bring to the table. So when I say there's a Mars metaverse and 150,000 people who want to participate in the Mars metaverse, that's what I'm talking about. That's their passion. They're going to drive it. And it's the only limit is what their talent brings to the table that they can create. It's not dependent on Meta or, or, or Facebook or somebody to create that for me and I consume it. I am creating it for myself. So a great way to dig into this is gaming, the evolution of gaming. Everybody here probably remembers and or has at least seen Mario Kart, right? Hugely famous gaming franchise but it's framed completely. Same way you buy Monopoly, you play by their rules. This is the same deal except on the web. Okay, forget about it. That's yesterday. What's gonna happen next is a look at a company called Roblox. I'm gonna show you this clip from a Roblox video. You are now back for 9,000 years. Oh my God! Taste my Van Hammond. Okay, this is a dumb video, right? It's, it's no great work of art. It looks like it was done by a 13-year-old boy, and it probably was, but that's the point. It was done by a 13-year-old boy himself using his characters, his avatar. He's in the game. I don't even know who did it, it doesn't matter. The point is Roblox gives you a platform to create whatever it is you want to create yourself, you and your, your friends or your relatives or just yourself. Here's another one. This is called Adopt Me. This is a Roblox game. This is user-created content. So you get your little egg, you take it to your home that you've created and decorated. Everything here is user-driven. The avatar, the, the person, everything the color scheme, you name it. And of course, this puppy loves you from day one. Okay, so you get the idea. Okay, here's the punchline. That game has been played 29 billion times. 29 billion. That is the most popular game on Roblox. And it's entirely user created. All Roblox did was put up the tools for people to build the world they want to live in, and that's what it looks like. Okay, Roblox is totally real. There are millions of user-created games on Roblox. 54 million daily logons to Roblox right now. 50% of that audience is under 13 years of age. 75% of the children in the United States between ages 9 and 13 have played Roblox or are playing Roblox. So what does it mean? What does all this mean? It means this is where things are going. Nobody's watching TV. Nobody's reading a book. Nobody's picking up a magazine. Why would you when you can go to this supercharged, very exciting, incredibly colorful world that is exactly what you want it to be all the time? Spotify is there. Gucci is there. Carly XCX, I don't even know who that is, did a concert on Roblox for participants, okay? This is where the world is going. When you see the big brands tune in to Roblox and put up a store where you can go buy Gucci stuff to put in your uh, home or, or hang on your dog's neck or whatever you want to do, that's, that's getting real, okay? Let's talk about then participation. 88% of Gen Z have been 
in the metaverse <laughs> or are in the metaverse today. 88%, pretty overwhelming. The other 12%, I think, probably don't even have internet connection, right? 40% say their closest friends are in the metaverse. So connections, they're making connections in the metaverse. 50% say they are more comfortable in the metaverse. So we're connecting now to fundamental human values of connectivity and honesty. They feel like they can be themselves in the metaverse, which honestly I find very strange because you're using an avatar that may or may not actually look like you, but they feel more comfortable in the metaverse. And 50% say that is the real me. The I am the real me in the metaverse versus school, family, home, whatever. And so I'm self-actualizing. I am being myself. I am expressing myself. I am doing things I can't do anywhere else. 53% say I can do things that are impossible in the real world, so I'm connecting with my passion. These are really powerful, fundamental human drivers that are highly emotional or just like reptilian buried in your core, when you can be yourself, connect to your passion, be honest and make connections, and it's all in the metaverse. None of that's real. So the metaverse is better than real life. I just gotta let that sink in for a second. The metaverse is better than real life. And this is what it looked like to Steven Spielberg in Ready Player One. I don't know if you can really see that very well, but this is essentially stacks of mobile homes on metal uh, support systems with satellite dishes and other stuff. This is a dystopian view of what the future living conditions in this city in, I think it was Tulsa actually, are going to be like. In other words, miserable <laughs> and gross, right? Nobody wants to live here. That's pretty obvious. And this is what the metaverse looked like in Ready Player One. Everybody's beautiful. Everybody's smart. Everybody's got just the haircut you want. This is the, the female heroine uh, lead. This is the male hero lead. And they're falling madly in love with each other. This is what I want life to be like. This is who I want to be. I want to be good looking. I want to be athletic. I want to do superhuman things. I want to connect fundamentally to people. I'm not able, I don't have the skills to do that in real life as well as I'd like. It's very frustrating. People are unpredictable. Not in the metaverse. In the metaverse, they're awesome and beautiful and great and cool and fun and we get to do superhuman stuff together. So that's what Ready Player One is showing you and Snow Crash is showing you and that's what's really happening in real life out there. So this is the new universe that looks like this. The building blocks are NFTs and crypto. We know how those relate to each other. You buy an NFT with crypto, you sell it with crypto, whatever. That's your sort of currency of the realm. And that intersects with reality for quite a bit of it, but it goes beyond the real world that we're in into things like the Rembrandt Museum, which is kind of real because the paintings are real, but you can only access it on the metaverse and there's nowhere in real life you can see all of Rembrandt's pictures in one place. And so we now verge into the metaverse, which goes way beyond reality and is way cooler than reality and looks exactly like this. These are our friends, the Board Ape Yacht Club people. And can you turn off, can you hit the lights for me? Because this is actually worth seeing. I'm going to go back and start this one over again. This is the Board Ape Yacht Club three dimensional uh, NFT that I told you about. And unfortunately, oh, there we go, the music. The metaphor is important. Notice the FOMO sign in the back. Crypto pumps, there they are. Board apes, there they are. More crypto pumps. Another NFT. See that?
Okay, you can bring the lights up. Okay, that's everything, right? With one exception, you are the board ape, right? When you actually engage with that, you're gonna be doing the flying around. You're gonna be doing the interacting with the other NFTs who are themselves real people somewhere in the world. Keep in mind, this is a global transnational phenomenon. Those people could be in Korea, China, <coughs> Pakistan, who knows? It doesn't really matter. It's their avatar that matters to you. And so you are going to experience that live in real time when you slap on those goggles and have at it. So that's, that's where it is, and that's where it's going, and that's what is the meaning is it's all going to transfer to the three-dimensionality, the intensity, and the vibrancy of Web3 uh, in terms of user entertainment, television, and other things like that. So there you go. The, I laid it all out for you, and, and I'm happy to take some questions if we have time. Yes, sir. When you talk about uh, car titles uh, yeah. and um, uh, oil and gas places, yeah. uh, that's understandable because we all kind of know how those fractions work and how complicated it is. But it seems that there's a big, there would need to be a big services component to that to be able to get it from the initiation of an NFT yes. that, that designates Correct. that because now it changes hands. It's got to go through the toll booth somewhere to change titles. And so then, that's the blockchain connection. Okay. So when you, let's just say you had an NFT of an oil royalty, and I'm ignoring the legal structure around that and so on for the moment because I'm not going to do it. I just get to talk about it so I get the easy part. Um, and it connects to the blockchain. And then it's visible by everybody. So when you want to sell it, you have to go back to the blockchain and agree to transfer to the next person. And then and that, that'll answer your question about how does the title change hands. It's a, it's a registration on the blockchain at the time you create that transaction. Did, did that no, get you there? OK, yes, sir. Can you turn cash into crypto Bitcoin? Can you turn cash? Can you sell your Bitcoin? Or, uh, or, or can you? Cash. Uh, yes, actually you can. Uh, there's a company called Paysafe that accepts your cash and will transfer it to the crypto exchange. But there are limits on how much you can do for money laundering reasons. That's why I was asking. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, John. How do you make money off this? How, how, do, how would we make money off this? What, what's to invest in? And uh, that's a great question. Uh, buy Meta stock if you believe it and you think Meta is going to be a winner. The issue, I think, with a company like Meta is uh, that uh, you've got upstarts like Roblox that are going out there and decentralizing it all. And I, don't, I think what Meta is trying to do is capture that market and get everybody's attention focused on them at a time when this is all kind of balkanizing and becoming decentralized and user activated. And it's not clear to me that Meta can win that game because Anybody can do this stuff. Remember I said NFTs, anybody can mint them. Uh, on Roblox, you can create your own game. So what's Meta going to bring to the table that's going to be a winner in that kind of environment? I don't know the answer. Um, I think with respect to investment, I think Bitcoin is in a class by itself as a global uh, refuge against collapsing currency valuations and but then you're buying the you're buying the commodity, not the process. And that's what she said is the value is the correct the process. Exactly. So how do you right. invest in the process? Uh, I don't have a great answer for that because those companies haven't become public at this point. Meta would be the only one I know of that's public that you could take a swipe at. It's still I will say you have not missed anything. It's still way early in this whole game. You're just gonna see a lot more. I'm sure you'll see Roblox at some point go public. Yes, sir. To follow up on, on Rick's question, how do you register on the blockchain a physical asset that doesn't have like an identifier? Like so let's take a bin. let's take a painting. Yeah. So how, how do you I tie the painting? The one. Yeah. How do you tie the painting to the NFT? Yeah. It's a great question. You're going to have to tattoo the number of the NFT on the back of the canvas. So you do physically put it. You have to physically it. identify it in some way so that the next buyer knows that it's Verified. been NFT. Okay and then we'll transfer that way. On the case of the bottle of wine, you'd have to etch the NFT number on the bottle, literally, and then find a way to make the seal tamper-proof so you know the contents are what they're supposed to be. So there is some of that. There's some, there's some kludginess here. Yes, sir. Um, I, I guess what, and some of us are kind of talking about, you know, all these kids on this altered reality, yeah. you know, from that standpoint. How, how Pavlovian 
is this to those kids? I mean, let's, let's, let's talk about it you know, from the, 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 the Chinese are, who are really yeah. our, our friends, yeah. are, are frankly our enemies in, in many ways, and they're, they're all learning math, science, and calculus, and how to build things, and we've got kids in these altered realities, and yep. we wonder why some of the kids are kind of screwed up now. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, you know it's what it that's what my parents said about comic books in the 1960s. Um, <laughs> I don't have an answer for you. I think the social implications are, are real, and I think they relate to uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, causation and correlation are not necessarily the same thing. But if you ask me, it relates to uh, latent development of social skills, delayed marriage. Uh, if you look at the, we, I was talking with Andrea earlier, if you look at the statistics of male female attendance in college, Women are killing it, right? They're 60% of the college attendees, and in some cases, like Occidental, they're 80% of the population at Occidental. So women are winning when it comes to college, and I have to believe that one of the drivers is uh, video games and online pornography. I didn't talk about it, and you might want to turn the camera off. <laughs> what I showed you was a lot of gaming. I'm going to leave it to your fertile imaginations about what this could mean in pornography. Uh, it's and it's not trivial, well, I, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, we're kind of we were all kind of just looking at it you know, just amongst ourselves and said, "This is some of this stuff is kind of scary." I mean, I get the idea of the from the title side and and the, the real life implications on yep. how to truly track a title, you know, from from yep. the blockchain and stuff like this, but some of the metaverse stuff. And, and we see so much incidents, uh, you know, you're just going to, to, the, to, to the women in college. Is that because of some of the degrees that they're getting? I mean, is there any value in some that's of the And that's a whole I've actually thing. done a lot of reading on that particular topic, and that's a whole huge and more that's complicated, a, a more complex that's issue. What the point I wanted to make to you was this is a largely male phenomenon mm -hmm. in the gaming world. It doesn't appeal to women as much at this time. Uh, that can change as it adapts and tries to figure out how to appeal to that audience. But uh, I do think it's a driver in male participation in society in general, development of social skills and other things. And I think it's a, to some extent a negative feedback loop. If you think about it, socially for a woman in an environment where there are twice as many women as men, um, I think you know, how that plays out socially for women is probably not a positive. And the men don't have to develop social skills, especially when they can retreat to the metaverse, where, again, as I said, everything is perfect. And you don't have to worry about what people do or think in the real world. You can live it in the metaverse, and it's much more fun and interesting. And so, you know, is there a correlation here? I don't know. Is there a causation here? Other studies have tried to pin that down. I think it's kind of iffy. Or, or, or difficult to do, but I do think it's real. I mean, it's, there's 24 hours in a day, right? If you're gonna carve out a lot of time to hang out in the metaverse, uh, as they do in Ready Player One and Snow Crash, this is what they do. I mean, in, in, in Ready Player One, the character actually gets down to living in a concrete box and has all of his food delivered and never gets out of his chair because every waking moment he's in the metaverse. And it's kind of absurd, but you're reading the book along and you think, wait a minute, it makes total sense. Why, why go out in that real world I showed you of stacked um, trailers when you can be in the metaverse and have a pizza delivered in a contained environment, everything's perfect. And you think about COVID and what COVID did to people's social relationships and ability to subsist at home, and it's not a coincidence that all of this is happening now, right? Because we practically shoved people into their computers and locked them in a room. So what do you think is gonna happen? You think people are developing social skills in that environment? I don't think so, I doubt it, sorry. Well, thanks. Uh, that was going to just make one additional comment. Joe and I got to go up to the Star recently to a company that sits up there that actually trains gamers. They have oh, agents, yeah. they have contracts. The Cowboys are invested in it. You can take your kids there to see what that world right. looks like in live. Right. And, and literally, at two thousand dollar chairs, these people sit in because they just come in. They never get out of them. And they have trainers for them. They have dietitians for them, and, yep. and men's and women's gaming teams that compete worldwide. And this Dallas team just won the deal in Malta recently. Yep. All this is happening just north of us on the tollway in the real live world. Yeah. 
And you know, and most of I mean, I went waltzing through this place and went, this is a whole world I didn't even know existed. You know, and, and, you, and you think plumbers are expensive now? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, and I, 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 I right. Jokingly, but. Uh, no, it's it, that's it, it, totally real. It, it, the, the so there right? are online gaming events that you can participate in, and there are professional teams. Mm -hmm. They are paying kids to play these games, and people buy a ticket to go to a live, real venue to watch them play video and games yes, on a screen. There. You can go in. They're going to open it back up. They opened it before the pandemic, closed it, and now you'll be able to go up there and sit and watch and watch these people play and game and even play against them if you want to and stuff. And they have it where you can sit. You know, scholarships. scholarships are giving scholarships for yeah. gaming. Yeah, 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 absolutely. What's it called? <clears throat> e -sports. Complexity. 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 Yeah. Go look up complexity on the internet. It literally sits up at the star, right yeah. in the corner of Gaylord and Cowboy Wood. Yeah, across from the Omni Hotel, right yeah. in the corner yeah. of Complexity. You and you'll see the it. sign up there, and literally you'll see pretty pretty quickly here that you'll be able to waltz in yourself as an adult or whatever. Believe me, you don't have to have a 16-year-old with you to get in. And, uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, but it's, it's interesting how this stuff is moving itself out into our world, and your comment that, you know, we. We're kind of we got our heads down, and, and we're, we're going to wake up and see ourselves in a different reality. Well, thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah, well, um, we we certainly left you. So, we left you with something to think about, worry about, keep you awake, you know, whatever. Uh, maybe we can all just figure out some way to make some money off of some of this too. But uh, but we again, we want to bring you topics and things that we think you'd like to hear about that are different and out there. So. Um, let us know what we can do to help. Let us know ideas you have to make the program better. And we'll see you in November. Uh, the invitations go out pretty quick. Thanks. All right.